consultant and lecturer based in Brooklyn, New York. Nationally recognized expert in the areas of cyber safety, digital misconduct, that's an interesting phrase we'll talk about, personal privacy, and other topics at the intersection of law, technology, and society. Mr. Lane has appeared on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, the BBC, MSNBC. He's written nine books, and we'll talk about each of those. He's currently working on his newest book, The Rise of the Digital Mob, which will be published next year by Beacon Press, and all of his books are available on Amazon.com or through his website, Frederick, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, Lane, L-A-N-E, dot com. <coughs> uh, Fred, thanks for being with me today. I'm, I'm fascinated by your story about how, as an attorney, you got into this work, and, and then, you know, the, the, the sense of this complex subject of cybersecurity and cyber safety is changing every moment, is it not? It really is. I, I, I appreciate the chance to talk with you, Steve, and, and thanks very much for having me on the show. It's, it's a great opportunity to let people know about some of the emerging issues that they really need to pay attention to, both within their own family and honestly within the country more broadly. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a ton of real estate for us to cover. I can give you the very quick um, sort of background in terms of how I wound up here. And it's pretty straightforward. I went to law school. I graduated from Boston College in 1988. I clerked for a couple of years for a judge out in Springfield, Mass., and then moved up to Vermont, where I practiced the insurance defense law for about five years. And um, that was enough to teach me that day-to-day -day lawyering was not what I wanted to do. And I was fortunate in the sense that I had had a lot of exposure to um, computers throughout my childhood. Um, we had pretty progressive schools in terms of bringing technology in. So I moved into computer consulting, starting off with uh, law offices in the Vermont area. And while I was doing that, I wrote a book proposal and managed to publish my first book called Obscene Profits, uh, the Entrepreneurs of Pornography in the Cyber Age. Wow. And that was really the, the yeah, it was, it was a, as you can imagine, a fascinating topic. It was really the first book that looked at the emerging online adult industry, um, both in terms of the economics, which were a preview of what the internet was going to do in numerous industries, as well as the social impact. What what does it mean that all of this adult content, which you know, which previously had been under the counter or in the back room of a blockbuster or something like that, was now going online, where it would be accessible by anybody, and we're still grappling with the implications of that. But on a personal level, what that had, what that caused, or what that led to, um, were attorneys who had uh, computer-related cases, and they needed someone to help with that. And between my consulting and having written this book, um, it, would, it seemed like a natural thing for them to reach out to me and ask me to assist with what became known as computer forensics. So, when I first really started doing it, nobody really called it that because the term hadn't really emerged. So that's um, really from crazy. a yeah, non-lawyer's perspective, that would what we would call the, the layman, we'd call digital discovery. You had a lot of those things about how, how computer data, imagery, you know, bytes, bits, reports, things are captured and how you can extract those and, and start to use them for cases? Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, um, electronic discovery or digital discovery now has kind of been adopted as the phrase for uh, civil litigation. So what it really gets to is turning materials over in digital form. Computer forensics um, is a lot of the things you talked about, but honestly, the, the best explanation for your, for your audience is it's the tools and technology that are used to recover deleted data. So, you know, in, in the most innocuous situation, if someone accidentally deletes their term paper or their thesis for their PhD or, uh, you know, 10 years worth of photos, a computer forensics expert at least has a possibility of going in and retrieving that data from whatever hard drive or laptop or what have you. Um, obviously, in the criminal context, if someone has done something uh, criminal, they often try to hide their tracks by deleting data. And what many, many, many um, defendants, and in most cases now we would refer to them as prisoners, 
uh, discover is that, in fact, um, law enforcement has extraordinarily powerful tools for retrieving that information. And so that's really that's really the main purpose of computer forensics. You know, when we think about pornography as a subject, I used to teach a class at, at Chapman University in San Diego on sociology and, and the pornography discussion came up as, you know, part of the, the core modules in the course. And, and, you know, what I discovered in looking at, I mean, it's just a, it's a vast concept, you know, how we capture pornographic images in this, in our society. But I know you know mm -hmm. this. I mean, I always tell people everything ends up as porn. So you say we have the cave, you know, the, the cave paintings in, in Vincennes, France, that, you know, that becomes paintings of people. And then we say art and sculpture evolved into, you know, naked people. Certainly the, the advent of photographs, I mean, you think of sort of Matthew Brady and President Lincoln from the Civil War forward in this country becomes pornography. Then the, you know, the first movies, you know, how soon can they turn those into those screeners or reelers that used to show up in, you know, peep shows in, in New York in the 1900s, and then feature films. And then, you know, I, everybody would argue that the, uh, the advent of Betamax, when we put things on videotape, mm -hmm. and then that led to VHS, right. and then the CD, and now the digital download. So everything ends up as pornography. It's funny to me how what, what so seems, you know, innocuous as emerging technology somehow ends up in porn. Well, I, I think that's a great point, and, and honestly, you've, you've kind of walked people through the first half of my book and seen profits, because that's really what I was doing. I, yeah, there are a couple of things that, that your audience might find interesting. Number one, the the debate about um, Betamax and VHS actually was one of those things that was settled by the adult industry, right? because you know, Betamax was a much higher quality, much better resolution, more advanced technology. But VHS was cheaper. And so in the process of transferring all of this dead weight of reel-to-reel -reel movies onto VHS and thus re-monetizing all of this content, the porn industry chose VHS because it was cheaper. Right. And the demand for the VHS was so profound that it basically blew Betamax out of the water. The other thing I think that was really funny was one of the, one of the little tasks I set myself in writing that book was, okay – out of all of the communication technologies that have come along, which ones have not been used for the transmission of pornography? And it's a really, really small list. I think the only one that I could say definitively was the telegraph. Right. Um, because even fax machines, of course, can be used to transmit images and so forth. So, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, there's, there's actually a meme on the Internet called Rule 34, which basically says – if it exists, it's either been used in a porn film or to transmit pornography. So, wow. Wow. yeah, it's a very pervasive. Yeah, it's a very pervasive issue. And one of the things when I go out to school, Steve, and I think you probably are on the same page on this, is trying to get parents and educators to appreciate the fact that we don't fully get yet what the potential impact is on all of this on our kids. Uh, because kids have never had the access to adult materials uh, in really in, in written history as they do now. And it's a pretty significant sociological shift. You know, I'm, I'm uh, almost 58 here, and the running joke with me and my pals, I was just, I spent the week in Kentucky with my best friend last week. And, you know, we, we say to each other, if, if at age 14 we had been given a handheld device, that could give us the access to the entire world, sports, music videos, games, unlimited pornography, chat with others. We'd never left the house. We, we'd yeah. ne we never would have well, went to play football. Many don't today. Yeah, we, we, we would have stayed in the basement. You know, our parents would have had to pry us out of the house if, they, if that device existed. So I, I guess, you know, the evolution of where we are, and, and, you know, I have a daughter who's an adult, 27, and I was worried, mm -hmm. you know, back in those days, <coughs> how soon can you give a child – you know, access to a phone or access to a laptop or a tablet. And, and I mean, you've seen in your work, I'm, I'm sure kids as young as six or seven or eight that have the ability to climb up onto the desk at home and, and access the laptop or the desktop or get to their parents' tablet or parents have given these kids tablets or, or cell phones. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's the youngest age yep. you've ever seen a kid walking around with a smartphone? Six, six or seven or eight? or uh, Three. Oh, my God. Three. Oh, uh. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, Steve, I mean, this is the research that I do every single day. Um, the earliest cases that I've had of kids 
sending inappropriate images of their own bodies is five. Wow. So, so there's and most a, things can go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, so there's a, there's a mindset with parents that, that somehow they need a cell phone for safety. I need to be able to get a hold of my kid at a moment's notice. Well, you, you, you and I managed to survive without our parents, you know, pestering us every five minutes. And, and this idea that, you know, we have to get a hold of our kids right away. What if there was an emergency? But, but that's just such a Pandora's box in terms of the technology. I mean, you know, I, I just yeah, I don't yeah. think how forward – that's why your, your book's so important, how, how forward-thinking are the majority of parents about what they don't realize what their kids can get access to on a smartphone. Well, it is it is hard, and and it, you know, in terms of the the ideas that I present in raising cyberethical kids, one of the most important, I think, is this concept of least feasible technology, and and by that I mean parents really need to think about what is the lowest level of technology that their child should have in order to accomplish whatever it is that needs to be done, and you know, of course, part of the discussion is you know what are in fact the needs and. You and I, it sounds like, are almost exactly the same age. And, and yeah, we totally survived going through elementary and high school without all of the bells and whistles. But it, it would be unfair to parents today to not recognize that things have changed, that, that there, are, there are threats that pop up in schools occasionally that obviously can, can cause panic with parents and they need to get a hold of their children and so forth. And in a much broader sense, kids are much more organized and calendared today than I think you and I were. Sure. I mean, we would go home after school and it was an open field. You sure. know, you would, you would figure out what to do. And actually one of the great things was you had to learn to cope with your own boredom, which I think is actually a profound life skill that people don't have as much today. So that's another issue altogether. But I think in terms of this idea of least feasible technology, you know, elementary school kids are a perfect example there are plenty of phones out there that you can hand to a kid. Uh, we just got back from the UK, as you know, and when we were over there, we needed a British number, and we got one of those little what they call candy bar phones, right. which you know really minimal functionality. It may have had a camera, but it was you know essentially like a 2001 Sanyo lens, which is to say you get a postage stamp photo out of the whole thing. But you could make calls, right. and you could people could call us back, and it was very easy. That's the kind of thing that parents should prioritize for elementary school kids, because there is absolutely no reason for a child, really, frankly, below high school, to have the capability to broadcast themselves to a global audience. One of the things in your book, which I think is a core, if I look at your book as I have, the, the core sort of theme is this family acceptable use policy. So we'll, we'll talk about that, and, and, and I want to give you a, a time to explain that. But I think, you know, there, that, that sense of that phrase, family acceptable use policy, is built into a, um, an agreement that parents have with their kids where the parents are still parents and in charge. <clears throat> There's a sense of, of structure and boundaries around what the kids' access to the Internet is. So I'm keen to hear your, your thoughts on that as kind of the core of the book. The other thing I, sure. I have a you know a side consultancy where I work with libraries and and I teach library security. I'm a workplace violence guy, and so I, I teach library security. Mm. And one of the larger issues, and and you, you can look at this sort of in four ways. Some libraries in this country do not filter, and they do not address the the behavior of patrons using the internet. So it's it's basically open season. You can do whatever you want, including pornography or even child pornography sometimes, because they say, well, we're not mm -hmm. we're not in mm -hmm. the we're not in the image police. Then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is the library has filtered programs, things like WebSense and, and things that you know a lot more than I do. There's, there's probably a long list of those that filters out, you know, objectionable content, typically pornography, but maybe violence and, and other sites and things like that. <clears throat> and then also not only do they have the filtering in place, but the staff is quite vigilant about, about you know, catching these male perpetrators who are bringing up the stuff. And then there's sort of an in-between area, which is, we don't have filtering, but we're very vigilant about about what people display on the internet in our library. And then the other one was we, we do have filtering, and and we just let the filtering do its work. So there's sort of four areas mm -hmm. there where, you know, the average soccer mom, you know, walking past in the library on a Friday morning at 10:30 in the morning and looks over and sees some guy looking at pornography is is rightfully outraged. And I I always say, you know, what are we doing about that in the library community? And the answer 
I mean, if you look at the American Library Association and some other places, pu Public Library Association, there, there's no fixed <coughs> sort of sense of this. It's, well, you know, free speech. So w what is your, <laughs> your take as, a, as an attorney and, and certainly study the, the First Amendment ab about when does free speech cross the line in terms of objectionable content that's being exposed to little kids? Well, that's, that's, wow, there's a lot of facets to that question. Sure. Um, just let me kind of put my cards on the table in the sense that I'm, I'm a very strong First Amendment advocate, um, probably not a absolutist, but I'm pretty, uh, pretty strong on, on the, the idea of protecting speech. Right. So that's one piece of it. Um, that's sort of my personal background. Um, I've actually had an opportunity to work on these issues a little bit. My uh, sister and her husband are both librarians in Massachusetts, and I've done a little bit of work with uh, Simmons College, which you may know is one of the leading library programs uh, in the country. So we've talked about this quite, uh, quite a bit. I would say to you that you know libraries are absolutely entitled to set reasonable use restrictions. Um, in terms of how their equipment is used, because they're not um, really censoring access to the content globally, right? They're not trying to shut down someone's ability to go to a friend's house and look at whatever they want, or, or you know, obviously in the privacy of their own home or what have you. Right. But there's reasonable accommodations to be made in terms of the sensitivities of children. I mean, many states, as you're well aware, have uh, harmful to minors laws which prohibit the distribution of material that is quote unquote harmful to minors. And we could have a long discussion about obscenity standards and how that plays into all of that. But, um, you know, in, in a public space like that, it's not inherently unreasonable for a library to say that's not acceptable behavior within this community. You know, just as they make editorial decisions, I mean, they're essentially gatekeepers, aren't they? Right. In terms of what books they select to put on the shelves. And so, for instance, a classic example would be that, you know, a small town library might say we're not going to get Japanese manga uh, cartoon books or graphic novels because right. they tend to be very explicit and we don't see a need for that, you know, in our collection. And that's not censorship. That's just an editorial decision. Right. So I don't I don't see any problem with the approaches that you outlined. I will say um, that. In my experience, my preference would be to have uh, an approach where the monitors are all visible, both to the public and to the staff, and you know the staff can step in and, and basically enforce rules. And obviously, you, you, you explain the rules to people before you allow them to use the computers, and that seems very, I think, straightforward and accommodating. Um, I'm, I'm leery in a public setting with government involvement in terms of using filtering software right. because I think then you're starting to make some arbitrary choices about what people can and can't see. And in my experience, the filtering program tends to be overly inclusive. Now, so, I have a different attitude on that for parents, but right. that's, that's another issue. Yeah, I want to talk about the family acceptable use policy. One, one more thing about the library, just put on your psychology ad for a second. Which is, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I work with what I would call challenging patrons, really difficult guys. You know, they're uh, you know, drug and alcohol issues, yeah. homelessness, mental health concerns. But, but there's also that, that percentage of patron, and I'm asking you to think, you know, it's like a psychologist here for a second, is, is w what is the compulsion in a public space for a male, you know, usually an older male, to, to pull up pornography in front of God and everybody and, 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 and sort of proudly display what he's looking at as folks are walking by. I've never understood that. I mean, you know, you think about pornography as mostly something that's viewed in the privacy of your bedroom or at least privacy of your home. Mm -hmm. But these, these people have no compulsion about what they're exposing other people to. I'm just wondering what your thought is about that. What, what's the thrill? I mean, is it I want to be <laughs> well, pr provocative or, or what's the what's the you know, what's the thrill? Yeah, well, and, and, and honestly, Steve, I, you know, over the 20 plus years that I've worked in computer forensics, um, I've had a chance to look at the psychology of people who are involved in this type of behavior. And I will tell you that um, it, it really runs the gamut, right, in terms of human behavior. Because, yes, you do have some people who feel an added thrill because they're transgressing in public space right. or 
because they're exposing other people to their material, to the things that they find arousing. Then I think you know another percentage of the people, and probably honestly the larger percentage of the people, are are individuals who are sufficiently disassociated from kind of social values and and social guidelines that it never occurs to them wow. that it's a potential problem. Wow. And you know I have a little bit of anecdotal evidence on this because my brother-in-law Matt, um, the, the librarian. Uh, for a number of years, did the overnight shift at the MIT main library. Wow. And as part of MIT's charter with the city, they basically promised to have a 24-hour library that was open to everybody. And he had a, a not insignificant homeless population that would show up um, when things started to get cold and they'd be using the computers. And, you know, it was just like they're, they're checked out. You know, they, they, they're just not really thinking in terms of the way that most people think in the sense of what will be the consequences of my actions? How will it impact other people? Those are elements of a functioning society and a functioning personality. And, and for a lot of people who go down this rabbit hole of, you know, increasing hardcore pornography or even child pornography, um, they've taken significant steps away from those values. Right. In, in your book, we talk about the family acceptable use policy, and I'm, I'm, I'm really keen on hearing your thoughts on this. You say in Chapter 1, a family acceptable use policy, FAUP, can help you and your children understand the benefits and risks of using the Internet and electronic devices and establish household rules. And, and you and I talked about you know, the importance of boundaries regarding their use. It's a document that can be used to organize and clarify family values, which I think is a, is a key phrase, regarding online behavior and the consumption of media content and will help children understand the consequences of their actions. So I think that's a really powerful, powerful paragraph. And, and, and so give me your sense of how you, how you get parents to buy into the concept and, 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 and put it to use. It's a great question, Steve. I, I want to start because it, it, it's important uh, for me to do so to, uh, or by giving a shout out to a good friend of mine, an uh, IT specialist named Keith Zamudia, who worked for the Cordova School District up in Cordova, Alaska for many, many years. And uh, during, I, I've had the uh, really great opportunity to, to go up to an educational technology conference up in Anchorage, you know, five or six times out of the last seven years. Uh, which is where I met Keith. And when we first started talking about these issues, uh, he mentioned to me that he had written one of these for his family. And we ended up talking at length about why he had done it and what he thought it accomplished. And so a lot of this book, Raising Cyberethical Kids, is uh, an expansion of the things that he and I had talked about. And one of the things I think was really interesting in, in that suggestion and conversation is this idea that it is in fact an opportunity for a family to figure out what are their values around the use of electronic devices and how do people honor those values and what are the behaviors that are expected in order to uphold those values and actually i think we can tie this neatly back to the first amendment discussion we were having right because one of the reasons I think that a family acceptable use policy is a good way to go is that it is taking control over access to materials from outside authorities. So if you have sat down with your children and you've talked with them about what choices they make about what they see online and what the context is for things that they see and how they should react, then you're not relying on a city or a state or a federal government to do that work for you. Right. And in a way, it's a very pro-First Amendment approach because basically what I'm suggesting is that every family is going to have its own values and its own boundaries for how devices get used and what material is accessed. And those decisions should be made on a family-by-family -family basis, not at a higher governmental level where we're trying to do one policy for everybody. So you, so, you, you really see it as a, mind, a contract. I mean, it's a, it's a literal contract, a behavioral contract. And, and, and yes, you, you yes. know, it's, it's age appropriate, certainly. You know, that it's different for a 10-year-old as it is for 16-year-olds. But it's really a, it's an empowering yeah. document from the standpoint of the parents to say, I, I have to take some ownership 
not just hand my kid this tablet, this phone, and then wander off. Oh, it's a huge part of it. Absolutely, Steve. You put your finger on it. And look, I, I did a media interview the other day that raised the issue of, you know, is this really just a pro-attorney book. <laughs> you know? And yes, I do call it a family acceptable use policy. And I do suggest that it take the general form of a contract, but I don't want you or your listeners to come away with the idea that, you know, this is something that needs to be witnessed, notarized, signed in blood, anything, anything like that. This is really, it would a, help though. A, a, a in, well, <laughs> possibly, depending on your kids. But this is really a what I what I consider to be a framing document. That is to say, it frames a series of conversations between parents and kids. And the other important thing about that is that in order for any agreement to be valid, as and I can say this in, as an attorney, there needs to be a meeting of the minds, which is to say both parties to the agreement need to understand what the terms are and agree to abide by them. And I think, as, and you, you've been kind enough to go through the book, you're aware that I talk about the fact that parents need to look at their own digital behavior as part of this. And what many parents don't realize is that kids are very sensitive to their parents' use of technology. Right. And one of the leading um, one of the leading complaints by kids in, in various surveys that have been done is that they're competing with devices for their parents' attention. So um, if we're going to make some progress on these issues, one of the things that has to happen, and this is what this book is designed to encourage, is for parents and kids to say to each other, what are your concerns? What would you like to be different? How do we handle this as a family? I mean, it could be something as simple as no phones at the dinner table, right? That's a starting place. That was absolutely one of our, our rules. When my wife and I are a blended family with four boys between us. And, you know, of all of the rules that, you know, would ebb and flow, that was the one that we held pretty consistent all the way through childhood was that, you know, at not just the dinner table, but when people are sitting down to eat together. Right. It's not a it's it's not a conversation into which the world comes through devices. It's it's, you know, six or, or however many people talking to each other over a meal. And it, yeah, that's that there that's a great place to start. So what do you what what's your answer in the context of of sort of the pushback, you know, there's a sense, you, you have boys, you know, I mean, of, of peer pressure yeah. and, and the sense of, you know, as they come into puberty and their adolescence and there's that challenge factor, they challenge authority, they challenge teachers, they challenge coaches, they challenge their parents. What's the, yeah, you know, how do you have that, that really difficult conversation that says, look, I'm still in charge here. I'm still your parent. I'm paying for this device. I'm paying for the internet service. I mean, I have the right to enforce these, these behaviors and, and, you know, there's a there's a pushback, which, you know, that that 12 to 15 year old range with kids is really tough. It doped. <laughs> yeah, I'm I, you know, I, it, I was laughing a little bit when you were talking about having a 27 year old daughter, because that's the that's the age of our two oldest boys as well. And um, it's really good to be on the opposite side of that 12 to 15 oh boy. Yeah. year age, oh, it was rough. age gap. But uh, it was a thing. But, you know, honestly, Steve, I think there's a couple of answers to that. Um, and you touched on one right off the top, which is, you know, who's paying for the device? Whose device is it anyway? And, you know, of course, kids get very attached to their devices. Um, the software is designed to allow personalization. And any time you personalize something, you develop an emotional attachment to it. And on top of that, you know, kids rely on these devices as part of their peer socialization process, right. which means that it takes on an additional layer of emotional importance to them. So you're really swimming upstream against a lot of emotional hormonal uh, issues in that age range. If, if it is still possible to do, and I direct this particularly to your listeners who have um, younger kids or maybe thinking about having kids, this is all vast easier if you start soon right. I mean, if, you, right. if you start having these conversations when kids are young and you're reinforcing the value with children that um, the device is not an entitlement it's a privilege 
then that goes a long way. And then, you know, in terms of peer pressure, I, I would say to parents, and, you know, please, we grappled with this ourselves, so I'm not suggesting in any way that it's easy, but part of the, the parenting process of that age range is helping them to understand when it is important to resist peer pressure and to really listen to, you know, what is being said and, and what encouragement classmates are providing and whether that encouragement is a good. I mean, you know the line, I'm sure, my mother used to say all the time, well, if everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you do that? Right, right. <laughs> Very straightforward. You know, and, and it's hard. It really is hard because these devices are honestly specifically engineered and designed to be emotionally compelling. So that, there's a... There's that, a, that con- is a yeah. yeah, there's a concept that comes up from the web designers, as you know, called stickiness, which is, you know, Facebook yeah. is sticky and, and, and YouTube is sticky and Reddit and everything else. And so, y- y- you know, y- you've seen the studies where there's actually an endorphin rush when you get a, re- a response to a photo that you put on Instagram. And there's an endorphin rush if you get a response to something you put on Twitter. I mean, it may be minuscule, but, but collectively. So this idea of, of the mm-hmm. stickiness, you know, that, that's a tough battle for parents with, with the, the teenagers to say, you know, th- yeah. there are folks staying up nights 24 seven, how to get my kid addicted, connected to whatever phrase you want to use to their device. Yeah. And addicted is not an unfair word in this universe. Um, let's be very clear about that. And that honestly, Steve, is one of the profound concerns about video games. Right. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not a doom and gloom guy about video games in general, but it is important to recognize that the entire reward structure of video games, putting aside the violence, I mean, which is a whole nother issue, but it, the reward structure of video games is specifically designed to tap into that endorphin mechanism. And that's one of the reasons that kids wind up playing like two straight days, you know, on given games. It, it can be incredibly absorbing. And we, again, have not really sat down as a society and addressed that. So, um, so one of your... you know, for, for parents who are looking for answers, though, again, starting early and just endless conversation with kids about these issues and, and checking um, is, is the best. Yeah. Yeah. And checking in with them on a regular basis. Not a, it's so the, the family acceptable use policy is not a one and done conversation, as you're saying. Oh, God, no. And, and I think you you highlighted the fact that there are different suggested topics for different age ranges. Right. And one of the reasons I did that is that, yeah, when you're sitting down with your, you know, first or second grader, you're going to be talking about different things than you will with someone going through middle school or high school. So, you know, the goal I hope with this is to encourage parents to see this as a childhood long conversation so you to help kids understand your new book's called Raising Cyber Ethical Kids. One of your past books was called Cyber Traps for Expecting Moms and Dads, and you've also got a book you're working on, mm-hmm. Cyber Traps for Educators 2.0. So define for us what a cyber trap is. Sure. Uh, a cyber trap is, is the term that I use for a um, basically an unexpected consequence that arises from the use or misuse of a digital device or electronic communication method. Right. So classic example is you're sending an email to someone and let's say you're you're sending valentine's day greetings to your spouse and maybe it's a little smoochy and a little bit you know risque and you accidentally send that to your entire company right that's that's just your classic cyber trap um the cyber traps for expecting moms and dads which i wrote was that summer of 2017 that was really um intended to help new and expecting parents understand the uh, the device and, and social media implications around pregnancy and infancy. Right. So, you know, a good example is, um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to pick on my sister Kate again, the librarian. Um, her three daughters have probably one of the biggest social media profiles uh, you could imagine. She's really proud of them. They're great kids. But she posts a lot of photos of the kids online, and it occurred to me that there were some issues there, right, in terms of 
you know, how she was shaping our perception of her daughters. There was at least a non-trivial risk that a photo could be taken off of Facebook. I documented a couple of cases in which um, advertising companies stole child photos and used them in advertising campaigns right. without permission. Right. Um, the list goes on and on. You know, should you put Wi-Fi? Should you put a Wi-Fi device near your infant? Uh, there are some legitimate questions there to to look into, and so on and so forth. Um, Cyber Traps for Educators 2.0, which is actually now live on Amazon. I just put the ebook up. Uh, the print book went up about a month ago. Um, that is an update of a book I wrote in 2015 about the various kinds of misbehavior by uh, teachers and what school districts and parents and, and the educational profession itself should do to try to minimize those risks. So I'm, I'm glad you're on, on that topic because I write a blog for Psychology Today, and in February of 2012 and August of 2012, I wrote two specific blogs about teacher misconduct. One is, you know, the need for oversight about this issue, and the second one was about female teachers as predators who engage in sexual relationships with young young males. And and you you I, you wouldn't, but I'm amazed about the emails I get that are hate speech to people that say men that say, "What's the big deal?" and you know, it's not harming this mm -hmm. boy to have, you know, he's 14 years old to have a sexual relationship with a 35-year-old woman. It's not harming him. And so there's that whole mindset there. And, and I, I think, I mean, you, you know this from your work, but the teacher misconduct issue in this country is a huge iceberg problem. There, a lot of stuff gets covered up. A lot of stuff doesn't make the news. A lot of stuff doesn't get prosecuted. Uh, I just finished working on yeah. a, I, I have an insurance client in California, and we just finished working on a pretty substantial document for all their school districts in California. They have all 58 counties in California that, that they distribute this document to. This is how do you investigate these cases? How do you liaison with the police? What do you say to the parents? What do you say to the, to the community? And it's a substantial issue. It really is. A um, couple of different things I'll follow up with there, Steve. Um, the double standard um, is pretty ugly, you know, in terms of how, uh, how female teachers are viewed and how male victims are viewed. And, um, you know, with, with female teachers, I think one of the things you've seen, and particularly social media has driven this, is that when a female teacher is involved as the perpetrator, the case tends to get a lot more coverage and a lot more salacious coverage uh, than a corresponding male teacher. Right. Um, so that's one issue. And, and one of the things, and I warn teachers about this, because a lot of my work, at least pre-pandemic, was traveling around to school districts providing professional development to, to teachers and so forth. And what I warn female teachers, just as a, a fact of life, is that newspapers and media outlets and investigators are much more likely to really dig into a female teacher's social media in an attempt to find, you know, the party photos or the bikini photos or whatever else it is, um, almost as, as sort of verification that this is a terrible person. Right. And it's, it's wildly unfair because that doesn't happen with men. With respect to male victims, uh, the only thing I would say to people is just watch some of the victim impact statements that are recorded and available online where you've got parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents talking about the impact on the male child, you know, in terms of their confidence, their ability to uh, cope in school, their long-term relationship implications, so on and so forth. Suicidality? And yeah. What's that? Suicidality? Oh, absolutely. No question about it. And, and yeah, there is a joke about it. There's, there's a number of sad jokes about it, but it's, it, it's really quite devastating for both men and women, young, young men, young women, uh, to be a victim in this kind of situation. So in terms of the overall scale of the problem, um, you know, I got to tell you, I, I think that there is a percentage of, um, the, there's definitely a percentage of cases that do not get reported. I've been involved with a group called uh, Sesame, uh, which is Stop educator, sexual abuse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and their goal is to reduce or minimize the uh, practice of so-called passing the trash right. in which a school district 
does not report what a teacher has done, kind of shuffles it under the rug and then allows that teacher to go to some other jurisdiction where, unfortunately, more often than not, they, they reoffend. Um, so, yes, there is a problem out there. Um, I do want to reassure people, though, that we have over 3 million teachers in the United States, and we are still talking about a very small percentage of people who engage in the worst behavior. Um, I, let's be clear. My book, Cyber Traps for Educators, covers, I think, 30 different topics. And there are a lot of different cyber traps that teachers can fall into. But in terms of the most egregious behavior, I do, I do think it's still a pretty small percentage. So you were talking about your sister and her kids and the posting of social media. My my sense is, and I, you, know, yeah. you, you would know better, is that I don't I don't think that that kids, especially younger, you know, teenagers, just have a sense of the the permanency of imagery on the internet. So uh, you know, a photo of mm -hmm. you you with your dogs gets somehow manipulated by somebody, or a photo with you standing with you know your friends at some event gets manipulated by somebody. And I mean, now we're seeing videos that can be manipulated. These these folks are really good at at the equivalent of whatever whatever Photoshop is for videos to put people's faces into videos. And, and you look at all the all the stars, you know, female stars that have had their faces put into pornography and things like that. So so mm -hmm. do, do you have a sense from your work that that teenagers in general, kids in general have a, any sense of the uh, or the uh, the permanence of their of their media? I do think that there's uh, that there's some growing awareness. I mean, I think we, we should be fair to kids these days and acknowledge how media savvy they are and social media savvy they are. Um, they, they really do have crazy technical skills. Um, one of the things I, I reassure parents about, though, is that even though the kids seem so far ahead technologically, they're not that far ahead in terms of judgment and wisdom. Maturity. Which hopefully parents right. have. Right, and maturity, which hopefully parents have in, in bigger supply. Um, the thing is that, that the, this idea of permanence, right, is, has filtered into the mindset of kids in a couple of different ways. I think it is increasingly true, and this is both a good and bad thing, that kids set up um, different accounts for different purposes in their lives. So they'll have a, you know, just by way of example, they'll have a Facebook account that's relatively clean and, and sort of college application ready, you know, that shows all the good stuff they're doing, blah, blah, blah. Um, they might have a, a Instagram using a different name that's a little edgier and, you know, they express themselves a little bit differently. And then they might have a Snapchat where, you know, sort of the, the quote-unquote action occurs. So there is some curating that takes place with imagery. Where I think there's a problem, and this gets back to computer forensics a little bit, is that kids don't understand how easily even Snapchat images can be captured and preserved. Um, for those who don't know in, in the audience, of course, Snapchat prides itself on the fact that uh, any image that you send using the app will disappear within, I think, a maximum was in at 20 seconds. Wow. And you can set that from 1 to 20 seconds. Right. But the problem is that if someone has a second device, which, of course, is not uncommon at all, they can take a photo of anything that shows up on Snapchat. And so then they've preserved the image. Um, there are other ways to get at it. Sometimes you can get at stuff computer forensically, blah, blah, blah. But the point being that kids want the impermanency they want to be able to do stuff and not have it linger around so they do get that idea but they don't necessarily understand the way the technology works and the fact that the internet is so good at preserving information so what we've talked about just really scratched the surface and i really appreciate your time and and also your passion about these these issues i know it, it really comes through we, <laughs> we can get a lot of stuff from from uh, your website fredericklane.com f-r-e-d-e-r-i-c-k lane.com the book is called raising cyber ethical kids the subtitle is how a family acceptable use policy can make your young digital citizens that's a great phrase safer smarter kinder and more empathetic so mr lane thanks a lot for your 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 passion about these issues i really appreciate it
So thanks for listening to this episode of Crime Time. I encourage you to go to my website at crimetimeradio.com. Send me an email with questions or topics you want me to cover on future shows. Connect with me on LinkedIn and follow me on Twitter at Dr. Steve Albrecht. In our world, there are sheep, shepherds, and wolves. Too many people are sheep and too few people are shepherds. There are lots of wolves out there. If there are not enough police officers or sheriff's deputies to protect us all, you need to be a shepherd. Take care of yourself and protect your family, your loved ones, your friends, and your coworkers. Pay attention. Be prepared to defend yourself with legal force if necessary. Be a good witness for the police if you see a crime. Stay safe and aware and alert at home, at school, at work, and on the road. Thanks for listening to Crime Time, and my thanks to Jim Wining, producer Matt, and all the good folks at Axe Media Group. I'm Steve Albrecht. Thanks for listening to what I know is right. <laughs>